Thank you. Uh, this is indeed a very happy occasion. Uh, we have not had an event with the Pakistan uh, Commission here for quite some time. So I'm very happy. It came at the initiative of the High Commission. He mentioned to me that these two very distinguished gentlemen were passing through Singapore. And whether we, I would like to meet them and whether I said would like to engage them in a discussion. I thought that was an excellent opportunity. And they have chosen a subject which is an extremely important subject. This mega project, $46 billion, 3,000 kilometers, affecting several regions, relatively underdeveloped regions. This is a fantastic project and a fantastic uh, is an impact on the countries in the region it's going to be so tremendous. For me, to go into the subject is, I think I will be wasting your time because we have one hour and we have two very distinguished people. And I think I will leave to the speaker to talk about this. I think our MC, the young lady, did mention the two speakers. Maybe I could just add that in the case of Mr. Khan, he's an old friend. Uh, when I used to be High Commissioner to Pakistan, he was Foreign Secretary. And I remember gate crashing one of his the co meetings where he was Secretary General. Uh, he was also Amut was also He was OIC and such man was uh, Foreign Secretary and Secretary. So it's a family ground for me and family people. Now one of the things bad habits I have as chairman of ISAS, I make club for Singapore and for ISAS. And what I wanted to tell you was that I've spoken about this to uh, High Commissioner. In July, we are going to have our third South Asian Diaspora Convention. And for this convention, we are inviting the Chief Minister of Punjab. Uh, we have already sent the invitation through the good officers of the High Commission. But I hope to visit and hand over a formal invitation to the Chief Minister. The word of explanation about the South Asian diaspora. The purpose of the diaspora convention is to bring together South Asian diaspora, Indian, Pakistani, Sri Lankans, and so on, to meet on a neutral territory where there is no, not too much of that. Established communication, established projects. This time we are going to have several things that are new. One is, of course, asking the states to come, like Punjab. We are asking two of the states from India. Uh, we will see whether the guest of honor is likely to be from Sri Lanka. Uh, and this will cover, among other things, entrepreneurship, education, and culture. You may know that we have an Indian Heritage Center. Many may think that this is just about India. No. This is India as defined, India defined as a subcontinent. In fact, one of our, no, not one of our, the most expensive artifact in that Heritage Center. I was involved in its construction and its uh, content and concept development is the Multan Gate. It was the most expensive and one of the finest things in that exhibition. The intricate mosaic handy work is unbelievably beautiful. And if you have a chance, you should listen. So that's one. And in the Diaspora Convention, we will have a segment on culture and we'll house it, uh, we will have it in uh, at the ISC. I'm sure you know one of the big institutions in there is Mustafa, the biggest, uh, the most successful department store here uh, along South Asia. 
So I will not prolong because I'm being given only five minutes. I want to say I welcome you all for this, uh, this event. And I mentioned to my commissioner and the deputy head commissioner that when you have people passing through uh, events that you like to talk about, come and talk to us and we'll try and see how we can do it. And we will be very happy uh, to organize it and get it. Normally our events are fairly well attended and we get uh, fairly good traction. So with that, I will call upon Shamsad Muhammad um, Khan uh, to start first and then
in the vicinity. So I took the plane and visited all of these republics. And my designation of Secretary General helped me a great because in the former Soviet system, Secretary General, the word Secretary General meant everything. So when I used to arrive there, my motorcade, like the motorcade of a head of state, would come to the right to the plane to receive them. Because they had just become independent, so they thought that some head of government is coming, so they gave me importance. And I, had, I was visiting them with a, with a purpose. So I took the opportunity of inviting all those presidents who had declared themselves as president because they were the uh, heads of the Communist Party while they were part of the Communist uh, Soviet Union. So they all agreed. So within months, in November 1992, we were able to expand ECO into a 10 member organization. Six of the Central Asian Republics, including Azerbaijan, which is not in Central Asia, but it is in Caucasus, and Afghanistan. So seven new members were inducted in 1992. So it became the second largest regional cooperation organization in the world after European Union. At that time, even ASEAN had not been expanded its present number. But that's immaterial. What I did was in 93, I took the initiative again, inviting Datu Ajit Singh, who was Secretary General of ASEAN, that just established cooperative linkages between the two regions. So I started instituting a system of inter-regional cooperation with ASEAN, and then with the help of United Nations, we involved SARC, and South Pacific Forum, and the United Nations sat together with us, the SCAP in, in Bangkok. We developed a blueprint of four areas of common interest for all these four regions. Energy, transport and communications, human resource development, and uh, trade and development. Four areas. Now, the transport, uh, what I wanted to convey here was Transport and Communication Network, the United Nations prepared a plan, blueprint, from ASEAN countries right up to Europe, passing through China, God knows what routes they prepared. So I used to often look at the plan and I said, how can it be possible? I really did not know at that time that one day it will become a reality. And now it is beginning to thanks to China. Now let me come to the subject of this afternoon. And uh, before I start, I'm reminded of what uh, a visiting journalist once asked Premier Chun Lai, that Mr. Prime Minister, what do you think were the long-term implications or effects of the French Revolution in uh, 1789? And uh, Chon Lai's sage reply was, that's what he said, it is perhaps too early to tell. That response on the surface may have uh, appeared a glib poetry, but at a deeper level it did reflect a truth, a reality, the reality of never ending impact of global dynamics in world affairs. So in that sense, any epochal event or uh, initiative or situation in any part of the world, in uh, uh, geopolitical, economic and technological terms, is never time barred and has always had long term and any such event invariably has wider outreach, not only for the 
country or countries concerned, but for the regions and for the world at large. So looking at the situation today, the Chinese have been working on uh, this project of connectivity for the last maybe one and a half decades. So if anyone in Pakistan takes the credit that well we got so much of investment, then please don't believe it. Because the Chinese have been working on this project much longer. And uh, President Xi Jinping, when uh, he first announced, formally announced this project, uh, it was 2013, 2013 in, uh, he was visiting uh, Kazakhstan and Indonesia. In these two places, he formally announced his vision. As I said, it is not a project, it is a vision. And what he said was, it's not just building bridges and roads that provide only single line connections to two dimensional links. We must, these are his words, we must also have three dimensional connections, infrastructure, institutional improvements, and people to people contacts. Vision, look at the vision. He said, we must advance connectivity side by side in five different areas. Coordination of policies, connection of facilities, each other's facilities, trade liberalization, free flow of capital, and people to people contact. So these are five dimensions of that connectivity vision. And this is the concept, China's concept of connectivity, which Chinese leadership, today's leadership, deems crucial for Asia's economic growth and a competitive edge for Asian economies. Now, our world, unfortunately, today is marked by challenges of uh, diplomacy, power game, wars of aggression, invasions in the name of self-defense, military occupations, economic adventurism, violence, religion-based extremism, terrorism and a discriminatory nuclear security order. This is a backdrop to this new initiative. So, looking at this uh, dreary scenario, we are also reminded of the ancient Chinese curse. Most of you might have heard this before. May you live in interesting times. Whenever they wanted to um, give a curse to somebody, they, they to wish and may you live in interesting times. So, which could perhaps never have been more relevant than our times at this critical juncture of contemporary era. Indeed, in our own lifetime, we are passing through interesting and critical times. And interestingly, in these interesting times, China represents Asia's only ray of hope. As a pillar of strength for the world community, China is already playing an important role not only in maintenance of international peace and security, but also in averting any global economic crisis. It is today a major stabilizing force in world's economic and fiscal system and also an effective stabilizing player in the UN Security Council. But at the same time, China has also has, has had its own worries its share of regional and global worries and concerns, and it is not oblivious of the challenges resulting from the US-led unipolarity after the end of the Cold War. 
So through this connectivity initiative, China sees bright <coughs> prospects opening up with human society developing at an unprecedented pace, scale. It has <coughs> identified its priorities for the first 20 centuries, for the first 20 years of this century, which involves further economic growth, improved democracy, relative terms, better education and advanced science and technology and upgradation of the quality of life for its people in all parts of China. I remember in 2005 I was visiting China, so I met the vice chair in person for the lady of the Communist Party. I asked her what were her their great priorities. She said our most foremost priority at this time is whatever prosperity we have Applied. Now we want to universalize in, within China. That means affluence to be passed on all areas of China. Now there are some areas in China where they cannot access convenient, like the, the western backyard. From the mainland, they can't go to those areas conveniently. So this project that Ambassador uh, Khaled Mahmood will explain to you will provide them an easy access through Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf, Gwadar Port, and another 1,200, 1,000 miles of Pakistan's territory into St. Kansas. So this is a kind of a vision where self-interest, they are looking at their own interest as well as the interest of other countries which happen to be en route. So it is within this, uh, these parameters that China is seeking to build its responses in meeting the challenges of its relations with other countries. Just to briefly give you the structure of this uh, project, it is it's called one belt, one road. This is in brief abbreviation, one belt, one road project. And it involves the Silk Road economic belt and the 21st century maritime Silk Road. These are the two parts of this. As announced by President Xi Jinping uh, during his visits to Kazakhstan and Indonesia. The 21st century maritime Silk Road is designed to go from China's coast to Europe through the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean in one route and that will pass through most probably Myanmar, Bangladesh and if India is willing to be part of this, India and then even Europe and beyond Africa. It will bring together China, Central Asia, Russia and Europe. Take linking China with the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean Sea through Central Asia and West Asia and connecting China with Southeast Asia, South Asia and the Indian Ocean. Now the Belt and Road connectivity with multi-dimensional benefits will run through the continents of, again I would say Asia, Europe and Africa, connecting the vibrant East Asia's economic circle at one end and develop the European econ economic circle at the other and encompassing countries with huge potential for economic development. If anything, ladies and gentlemen, this is China's answer, not in military terms, but in socio-economic terms in what is generally known as America's Asian Pivot, which is essentially a militarized initiative to keep China contained through counter forces that it has been building around India, around China. So China, instead of reacting in a militarized manner, this is China's response to that. They may not declare it in public. They wouldn't say that this is a geopolitical initiative. No? 
For example, there have been comparisons of this initiative with Europe with America's Marshall Plan for Europe. But in many ways, this comparison is valid. Although, in terms of money, at that time, the Americans spent about $13 billion on Europe's reconstruction after the war, Second World War. The, this project of completion will involve more than maybe 155 or 160 billion dollars. And for that, Chinese have already started taking initiative. They have established a, a bank, infrastructure bank, and they are making involving countries themselves. So it's a collective effort. Now, at an estimated cost of 150 billion, this project connecting countries from Asia to Europe via rail, roads, sea lanes, energy pipelines, and port infrastructures will in fact link all these regions together, putting them all on the cusp of an economic transformation. And the overarching vision, once realized, if this project is accomplished, will directly benefit four and a half billion people or 65, or approximately 65 percent of the global population. So far, more than 60 countries along the routes and international organizations have shown interest in taking part in the completion of Belt and Road Initiative. It is in line, this, this whole uh, initiative is in line with the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. It upholds the five principles of peaceful coexistence, mutual respect for each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity, mutual non-aggression, mutual non-interference in each other's internal faith, equality and mutual benefit and peaceful coexistence. So, five principles. Now, as I mentioned earlier that uh, some observers look at this project as China's own version of America's post-World War II Marshall Plan, but Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi dismissed comparisons of the initiative to the US-sponsored Marshall Plan. The initiative, according to him, is the product of inclusive cooperation. Now, they would not talk about geopolitics. They would not even say that it is a response to America's issue, whatever America is going to isolate us. So they are reaching out to the people of the world with all the benefits and fruits of economic development. So he said, it, it is an inclusive cooperation, not a tool of geopolitics and must not be viewed with an outdated Cold War mentality. That is a diplomatic statement on his part. And he, and he also added that China's diplomacy is just focused on making progress on the Belt and Road Initiative. So whatever it is, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is certainly more than the Marshall Plan as it does not involve any post-war reconstruction or rehabilitation. So having said this, let me say that China has practically demonstrated to the world that what it says, it means. Last year, if you would know, it operated a train from its uh, uh, southern coast, UV, main coastal town, to Madrid. It passed through eight countries and changing the gauges, engines, en route, but it made the entire journey in 14 days. And it, is, it was the longest train route anywhere in the world, even longer than the that <coughs> the ancient, what was the task, European or Siberian. So longest train. And not only that, latest only, uh, I think few weeks ago, they sent a train to the I remember that as part of ECO, my organization, I had facilitated the opening of establishment of a train railway link between Iran and Turkmenistan. And I was there when this project was inaugurated. I remember that we invited the heads of state of all the countries. My own president, Pakistan president, was also there. Now, making use of that railway link, China sent a train from the same coastal town to Tehran, passing through Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, and using the same train link. And uh, under the ECO, 
blueprints that are already there that we prepared in 1993, all eco countries were to be linked by road, by rail, with each other and with the outside world. And uh, so now four of the eco countries are also members of uh, China and Russia sponsored Shanghai Cooperation Organization. So there is a tremendous overlap between Shanghai Cooperation and ECO. We have planned, uh, blueprints already lying there, unimplemented. Yes, I admit, because of the Afghan situation, those projects could not be implemented other than this Turkmenistan Iran railway line because the Afghan situation did not impact on that. But uh, gradually, if China is becoming involved in the region, so we are confident that together China and Pakistan will be a major, major factor in revival of peace and stability in Afghanistan. So in that sense, we would work together, both China and Pakistan, in converting the Afghan border into a gateway, economic gateway to Central Asia. So the whole project has vast horizon and tremendous prospects and uh, Chinese have already started uh, delivering on what they say. They have shown to the world that uh, a journey that takes three months now to Europe by ship, well, they can do that journey in less than this is uh, the uh, regional and global dimension of uh, this project and uh, as far as uh, the domestic national part of uh, the corridor, economic corridor is less to share this perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador Sir. Now I'll turn to Ambassador Harry Kong and he will give the details. Ambassador Shachadan has given us the background, the conceptual framework and the international aspect or the context of this uh, uh, visionary initiative by President Xi Jinping, which is called uh, One Belt One Road. Now this initiative you know, consists of a number of land routes as well as one maritime. In the land route are included a route through Eurasia, a route through Pakistan, a route through Bangladesh, Myanmar, India, China. And maritime route is connecting as Mr. Chichas told us, 21st century maritime ship route, uh, South China Sea, Indian Ocean, and one Europe. So this, uh, I might be concentrating on the Pakistani land route, that is China-Pakistan economic code. We usually call it CPEC. You are aware of uh, the deep ties of friendship, cooperation, and 
سسٹم کے پاکستان میں جائیں
28 million dollars to cater for what they call early harvest projects. Projects have been divided into three parts. Early harvest, that is within three to five years to be completed. Then medium term, within 10 years to be completed. And long term, within 15 years. So for these uh, early harvest projects, $28 billion already uh, committed. Uh, and out of 28, again, 20 billion are for energy projects. <coughs> and uh, China has already established uh, uh, two uh, major institutions. Uh, this uh, AI aviation infrastructure no, uh, fund, and also Silk Road fund. Now, funding of these projects, especially of energy, will be done by the Chinese companies who will be provided funds or who will take loans from either these institutions or from the Chinese government. And the remaining will be uh, to the, remember this is investment, not loans. In, Government of Pakistan is not taking note. These will be invested by the Chinese companies. But the remaining uh, about uh, out of the 28, 8 billion dollars will be just the loan aspect. And Pakistan on its part has also allocated 3 billion dollars in its uh, development. Projects. So, as these projects get in the way, especially this early harvest, uh, it is going to have a, a major impact on Pakistan's uh, economy. And similarly, as uh, been pointed out by Mr. Sushant, that this CPAC will be linked to other uh, land group projects. Uh, so in other words, Pakistan will become a hub of uh, communication, transport, road links with uh, Afghanistan, Central Asia, and uh, uh, water port will provide access to China uh, towards, you know, West Asia and uh, Europe and in fact Africa. So for both Pakistan and China, this is a what they call win-win situation. Now what Pakistan will gain? Uh, first of all, what China? Uh, what is the uh, Chinese subject? So China has of course developed, but the development has been uneven. Western China, there is a yawning gap between the economic status condition of West China and the Eastern Sea. There is more than $5,000 per capita in Eastern Seaboard and less than $500 in Western China. So the Chinese government has a deliberate plan now of focusing on bringing Western China, and in fact Central China also, at par with the Eastern seaboard economies. But how can we do it? Because it's a landlocked area. So the easiest access for China is through Pakistan to Guadalajara, about 3,000 people. Otherwise, for imports, exports, Western China, can you see the Xinjiang? Province has to traverse the whole landmass of China, go to Shanghai, Tianjin on the eastern seaboard, then through all the sea route, and then reach where the Guadal is. While directly they can access Guadal in shorter period with less expenditure. So this is one that the 
requirements of developing Western China. Uh, for that requirement, uh, the CPEC will play a pivotal role. Secondly, as you know that uh, Pakistan is afflicted with uh, the curse of terrorism. And that is also, Western China is also facing the same problem. The Xinjiang Plan, ATIM, Eastern Kumaristan Independence Movement is there. And China hopes that through development of this area, it will help in checking this menace of terrorism, both in Pakistan as well as in the adjoining area of China. Uh, thirdly, presently Chinese all new uh, economic lifeline lies through East China Sea and the choke point of Strait of Malacca. And uh, China, given the situation, then situation in this area, uh, uh, you know, feel vulnerable. And it's uh, so much dependent on energy supplies which come from Middle East, that through this route, uh, they uh, want to uh, ensure against uh, uh, that there is no disruption, uh, interruption in the supply of uh, energy supplies. So for that also, this route of, of CPEC will provide China with a shorter, more secure, and cheaper route to meet its energy demand. So it, it, the China will be able to avoid the vulnerable situation in the South China Sea, Indian Ocean, and Malacca states. And Pakistan itself also is a big market for China, 200 million. Soon, you know, market. It will uh, uh, be easy for China to. Uh, to uh, be exposed to Pakistan and uh, onwards. For uh, Pakistan, as I said already, it will help us in overcome our energy crisis. Uh, currently, 5,000 megawatts shortfall likely to increase. So these projects initially in the early harvest program uh, there will be addition of about 10,400 megawatt within three to five years. And over the longer period 16,000 megawatt addition to the national grid. So this is one benefit to Pakistan. Secondly of course it will Availability of uh, energy would uh, lead to increased economic activity. As I said, in their plant, um, economic zones, industrial parks uh, along the uh, this route. And Pakistan will also get an easier access to uh, Central Asia which is a market for Pakistan, and also a uh, source of energy. And it is a mistake that Chinese might locate some of the, their industries to along this uh, CPEC route. So it will help uh, to integrate, uh, to help Pakistan to integrate various sectors of its economy into value-added chains of China's uh, manufacturing process. And uh, of course, it will also help in checking this menace of terrorism as the conditions of this areas of Rochester, KPK, improves. Uh, this will like to have a salutary impact uh, on the situation there. 
And since the CPEC cannot fully take off, of course, with Pakistan, uh, uh, there are more now brighter prospects than before, but it cannot fully develop unless there is peace and security within Pakistan, there is peace and security in of stability in Afghanistan. So uh, that's why China has now come in in a big way uh, in stabilizing the situation in uh, Afghanistan. Previously, it was uh, just economically direction, hands off. But now it is directly participating along with Pakistan, Afghanistan, and United States in taking any initiative for a reconciliation process uh, in Afghanistan. What are the challenges? Of course, it looks all very nice, but there are certain many serious challenges also one has to address. One is security. Security within Pakistan, and security. <coughs> Happily, within Pakistan, the situation has improved. Following a very determined military operation called Zerbe Azud, which Pakistan has taken in the, the area that joined uh, Afghanistan. And it has been considered very uh, successful in uh, uh, you know, stamping out uh, terrorism in that part of Pakistan. And I already alluded to that situation in Afghanistan is getting better now uh, with this uh, effort and uh, stabilization. And we are also cooperating with China in uh, combating terrorism in Western China, in Xinjiang. Uh, there's a regular mechanism, joint uh, exercises. We have nabbed many of the leaders of uh, the CPIM and some of them we have killed and some of them we have handed over to China. So in other words, this uh, uh, challenge of uh, uh, terrorism is being addressed. And what's more, Pakistan has raised a special division of 12,000 troops to guard CPEC installations and so headed by a major general. This is in addition to the 8,000 we already had to protect the Chinese civilians. So all efforts are being made to ensure security, adequate security for this project to succeed. Second challenge is relates to national consensus. Now, there's a long impression that uh, some provinces are against the CPEC. They are not against. They are for CPEC. What they are quarreling about is who will benefit more, who should benefit more, who should have more projects under CPEC in their own province. So, not that they are against CPEC, but, but this is a problem. That, that uh, there should be national consensus there should be no dispute of, on this mega project. After all, $46 billion dollars are at stake. Now, to, to create consensus, the government has taken several actions. All parties' consensus have been held, and uh, uh, all uh, a steering committee has been established consisting of uh, chief ministers of all the provinces to oversee the uh, implementation of this project. Uh, a joint uh, parliamentary special committee has been established to monitor the progress. Uh, so there is now a growing consensus and uh, uh, because of uh, Prime Minister's uh, uh, the controversy is which route the, this CPEC should take. Is it, there is a western route, there is a central route, the eastern route. Now, western route goes through very rugged areas, underdeveloped. And naturally, 
Chinese or any investor would like to invest where there is quick return and that is which is a developed area. But to, in order to ensure national consensus, uh, Prime Minister has said that priority will be given to the development of the Western sector which passes through this relatively less developed areas of global And in fact, 7 point out of 28 billion, no, out of 46 billion, 7.1 billion dollars have been allocated for development of projects, CPEC projects in Rochester, which is the second highest allocation among the provinces. And out of the 870 kilometers long road network, under CPEC, out of 800 in Rochester, 556 kilometers have already been built. So, in other words, effort is being made to ensure this uh, restive area of Rochester, KPK, that they are not being ignored in this whole project, and this is all propaganda. Of course, it takes time. These are not switch off on projects. It will not that tomorrow you can ensure that uh, you have this project. What is there is that the projects have been identified, financial uh, allocations have been earmarked, and also uh, necessary institutional arrangements have been made to oversee the implementation of the projects. Then, of course, there is the challenge of uh, environment because it is said that uh, coal fire, you know, is. Uh, Our projects, they might uh, not be uh, eco friendly. But here also now, effort is being made to use the new technologies uh, which will uh, try to neutralize this negative uh, impact. Uh, in fact, what's lacking is that uh, there is some communication gap. There is a propaganda against this project. And against China, against Pakistan, or this link the two countries. So the government needs to be, tries trying to be more transparent in sharing all the information with the project them on the television, from media, and all this. Another uh, impediment or challenge is that, uh, as I said, when this CPEC goes through these areas which are very sparsely populated, not well educated men are, that these people feel marginalized. More, uh, uh, you know, more skilled people will come from either China or from other parts of uh, Pakistan. Uh, so that aspect is also being looked at. That's why as a part of CPEC, uh, in Rochistan, uh, some vocational training institutions are being uh, set up. Uh, health staff technical hospitals are being set up. Uh, clean uh, drinking water facilities are being established. Uh, so that the people there get benefit of this uh, CPEC. In other words, CPEC is being made people centric. Because otherwise, there will be revulsion or resentment that aspect is also being uh, guarded against. Then, of course, Pakistan itself has to gear up its uh, implementation machinery, uh, its absorbing capacity. And uh, for that also, uh, the, the, uh, Pakistan and government is not oblivious of that and it is making necessary. It's not, and it has been going on for the last now uh, three, four years. Um, but then there is question of external things, which are quite serious. Uh, one is, uh, of course, uh, the situation in Afghanistan, but that is now improving. But India has objected to this. See that project. When uh, Prime Minister Modi went to China, 
Foreign Minister of uh, India, Sushma Swaraj, said that he told Chinese that this project is unacceptable. These are the words, unacceptable. And uh, Ambassador of China was called uh, in Delhi by the Foreign Office to which this uh, objection was registered and similarly Beijing. Now they object that this CPAC will pass through an area which is disputed, that is Jammu and Kashmir. But I think this is a, an objection more pro forma because already Karakram Highway goes through that area. It has been there for so long. But one can understand just to um, Disturb one's point, you have to make this. But what's more, uh, what's more disturbing is that uh, we, the government has evidence that uh, uh, external interference from India at uh, commenting this uh, restlessness or insurgency in Afghanistan or along uh, this border. Pakistan. And for that, uh, our Prime Minister even gave evidence to the uh, United and the United States uh, United Nations. But uh, in uh, India, there is divided opinion. But government position is this that they have said this is unacceptable. But uh, some right thinking people there are saying no, we should not miss the bus, uh, we should not get marginalized. Because uh, India itself will be a gainer if it joins this process. Then it will have access to Central Asia and you know, Afghanistan and uh, with China, in fact, also. Because I just read uh, one of the piece I'm saying. They say, staying outside cannot be in India's to India's advantage. New Delhi needs to and that that uh, is very fine print now, that uh, India should join in this project uh, because otherwise uh, uh, if you get uh, sidelined a wise approach would be to join the regional networking process uh, just as India has joined the, even the infrastructure bank, so they should could have also uh, remained uh, dissociated. Now there is another, uh, uh, I am talking all the challenges, that Karcha Bahar is a project in Iran, which is being built by, with the help of India, developed by India, and that is that India wants to reach Central Asia through Iran, bypassing Pakistan. Uh, but uh, the people say that that is no match to Bahar. First of all, China, the Chabhar is not connected to China, while Gwadar will be connected to China and Central Asia. Chabhar will give access only to Central Asian states. To China, in a circus manner, through various countries, which will take a longer period and uh, more expensive. But what's more, Iranian reaction. Some people said, no, Iran wants to develop Chabahar as a competitor to Guadalajara. But uh, after the lifting of sanctions, the first foreign president. Uh, visit China was present and there uh, Iran signified uh, its uh, agreement acceptance of uh, uh, this uh, link with uh, the CPEC and as uh, the special charge said already they have sent a train even for their own direct link also uh, from uh, uh, south east, west east you know, city uh, what was the name? 
Imu to uh, Tehran, uh, which is uh, about 14 days. So in other words, Iran is now thinking of joining this whole project and not uh, rejecting uh, integration in this uh, process. But for the attitude of the United States and uh, Britain, it was said China and the United States initially had some reservations. They, but now, even before coming here, we had some Americans coming to us and uh, other institutes, and they said, no, we now support. They said, we want to be part. In other words, they want to also benefit by like getting some contracts or, you know, whatever, uh, join this economic uh, activity. Uh, same is the case with Britain. Uh, Britain has also signified that they would like to uh, be part of this uh, economic uh, rejuvenation process to take place under the seat of this area. So, but the United States said that, but still we will keep under the observation the effects of this in the long term, how it will affect growing, how growing influence of China will affect America's interest in this area. But so far, in the immediate future, they will be uh, not obstructing uh, but uh, in fact uh, supporting this uh, CPEC uh, project. Um, what are the challenge? Hmm? So these are the, the external challenges and uh, so what uh, I want to just tell you that uh, this work in right and this has started. I already told you how many kilometers of roads have already been laid, how the projects have been identified, how they have been categorized, uh, early hardware, medium, long term, how the financing has been arranged, and uh, what other institutional arrangements are being made to develop national consensus, to have oversight over these uh, of these projects and uh, already world is uh, taking notice of it, the uh, uh, ratings of Pakistan economy have already uh, uh, been upgraded by the rating agencies and uh, we hope that this will indeed be a game changer as they say for Pakistan's economic fate, for the regional economic development and will also impact uh, Thank you. <laughs> May I thank the two speakers for excellent presentations. I think they have given uh, a lot of information and uh, we can have about 20 minutes of uh, very active question and answers, uh, interactive session. So I will throw it open to the house. Um, Maybe before we start with ISAC, can I ask the others to first and then uh, uh, we can come to ISAC. Being the host, I think we'll hold back for a little while.